This week, we're looking back at some of the highlights from the Category 5 Community Coffee Break. And I'll be tearing apart my laptop with the hopes of replacing the noisy cooling system. Becca's got your top news stories, including a warning to Samsung Blu-ray player users, Apple is moving to ARM processors for the next generation of Macs, and Microsoft is killing off Mixer, but contrary to their statement to the public, they're really burning the hardworking staff who made it possible. The crypto and crypto finance market is blowing up, and Robert Koenig is here to tell us what's going on with the explosive DeFi marketplace. This is all coming up, so strap in, it's time for the tech. Our live recordings are trusted only to solid state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5 TV streams live with Telestream Wirecast and Nimble Streamer. Tune in every week on Roku, Kodi, and other HLS video players. For local showtimes, visit Category5.tv. Well, hello there, everybody. My name is Robbie Ferguson. It's nice to have you here with me again this week. And it's good to be here at Studio E. That's our A, B, C, D, E, fifth studio. Our fifth studio, Studio E. And it would not be possible without your support. I want to especially say a big thanks to BP9, Scott Barkley, Ron Morissette, Jerry Kowalski, Jonathan Garby, Jens Nissen, Ameridroid, also Noman5, and Bill Marshall, as well as NICAD, and everyone else who has supported Category 5 Technology TV through this entire time. This year has been an odd one. 2020 kicked off January 1st, and my resolution was to lose some weight, and I've done well. Lost... Uh, anywhere from 14, we'll say 14 to 18 pounds. So almost 20 pounds, but it's kind of like, yeah, fluctuates a few pounds here and there, but I've lost some weight. That's my new year's resolution. You remember that at Studio D, um, I purchased a, a new scale, a smart scale to help me to be able to keep track of that weight loss process and, and my progress. And it's been cool to see the graph. And those of you who picked up one of those scales, um, know that it is really, really neat to be able to pull out your smartphone and see the trends and, and see, and, and it's like a, a challenge for yourself, a bit of an encouragement just to know the numbers, I think has been really, really helpful for me. But that's how the year started off. So, hey, one good thing came out of 2020 so far. <laughs> and then we found out that we had to move Category 5 Technology TV at the end of February. So that was not too far into the year at all made the announcement and uh, we held a Kickstarter campaign which uh, was successful and I thank you so very much for your support. Um, and we had to move at the end of March. But as you know, of course, this whole pandemic thing kind of took off mid-March. So here in Canada, it was, it was a couple weeks into March when things really started getting serious. And so we moved everything in as best we could but I couldn't have my team here really helping to unpack or get things set up. And so it's been that kind of struggle to get to the point where we're up and running at full capacity and we're not there yet. I can't wait until Henry Bailey Brown can be here in the studio with me, probably like on another camera over in the far corner, but he'll be here. Jeff Weston will be here. Sasha Rickman has had to move across the country to Newfoundland, but she'll be here in some way or another. And one of the cool ways that Sasha has been able to participate in our community, even through this time, and how some of our community has been able to keep in contact and, and kind of keep up to date with what one another are up to, is through a program that we host called Coffee Break. 
and our Category 5 Community Coffee Break is held in general once a week. We do have the occasional exception, uh, including this week, because I am going to take my wife and kids away for the weekend, and I'm really looking forward to a little bit of downtime. I think we all need a little bit of respite every now and again, and this week it's it's time for for me to get the kids out of the house and 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 go somewhere and just kind of relax and and spend some time together to just playing board games and things like that having campfires really really looking forward to that and tis the season we can't do everything that we normally do we can't go window well we can go window shopping we can't go you know taking the kids into all the stores that we normally would up in cottage country and all that kind of stuff and can't do our grocery shops the same way that we used to. What a world, eh? I posted on Twitter this morning um, with my mask on at work that who, who knew when 2020 started that I'd be a, a ninja, <laughs> or at least I'd look that way. But um, so with the rare occasion where we're not actually holding one, um, typically it is once a week that we hold the community coffee break. And the whole purpose behind that, and I'm talking about, you know, this is all that's been going on, and I know that everybody's been affected differently throughout the pandemic, but the coffee break was set up specifically to give us a place to go. Just like I'm going away to the cottage this weekend, it's a place for you our community, the Category 5 TV Coffee Break, is a place for us to all get together and just go, <sighs> just get away from it all. Just have some respite, some time to hang out with the community members and just be ourselves, have fun, chat about random things, the technology that has us excited this week, and not talk about the things that are bringing us down. That's the Category 5 Community Coffee Break. And let's take a quick look at some of the many highlights of the Category 5 Community Coffee Break. And I'd encourage you, um, as you watch these clips, to check in and, and visit the Category 5 Community Coffee Break by going to our website. Category 5 TV is category5.tv. And when you're there, scroll down on the homepage and you'll see the schedule for the coffee break. And I'd encourage you to be a part of that. It's a very small, tight-knit group right now. And I know that our community is much, much larger than what's represented in the coffee break. And that's part of why I wanted to show you, because maybe, maybe you don't know that you can join it too. And I'd love to have you as a part of it. So let's take a look at some of the, some of the highlights. There have been, oh, wow... I think it's like 63 coffee breaks so far. Wow, right? So among those are some gems and some where we just sat around just, ah, just hanging out. But among those, I've pulled some clips just to show you a little bit about what goes on on the coffee break. So here you are. A uh, really cool thing about the Pine Phone is that um it is completely modular well you know as much as most phones can be um it's got a removable battery oh yes yeah. <laughs> uh, that's a standard uh, samsung, that's a standard samsung j7 battery so you can uh, get them really easily even though this one's branded by <laughs> or it's just a standard battery uh this is the the uh, module that does the wi-fi bluetooth and Oh no, what timing? Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and what? <laughs> I'm glad it wasn't just me. <laughs> <laughs> you dropped out there, Bo. You said this is the oh, Wi-Fi, G Bluetooth, and... GSM. Uh, okay. So that's a, that's a quick tell module. So this actually runs a stripped-down version of Linux on it. So that's, oh, that's the only <clears throat> uh, closed part of the entire phone. Is that is it, that module right there? Is it just but me, or is this like Mark Shuttleworth's dream coming to light in a, in a lot of ways? <laughs> Let's see if I can get close enough here. Canonical uh, really wanted to do the Ubuntu phone, right? Oh, and this is oh, this yeah, is a Linux right. phone, folks. 
So you, you can, I don't know if you can see it, but these are our uh, dip switches right here. Yes, are these. Nice. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those are our hardware disable switches for uh, different things. This little white label next to it tells you what they are. Uh, it's modem, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, microphone, wow. rear camera, front camera, and headphone. That's what you can turn off uh, and by hardware. Do, do you sell those at Ameridroid? We will be as soon as they're available. Oh. Um, and this right here is uh, our pogo pins. Mm -hmm. So these are uh, I squared C interface to the phone. Oh, nice! So, wow. So people can make a uh, you know like keyboard cases or extended batteries oh. or you know, anything that does I squared C. <laughs> uh, oh, expansion. nice! Yeah. And this is like how much is a is a Pine phone? Remind me, Bo. Uh, it'll be less than two hundred dollars. Wow! Yeah. And uh, so here, here's Manjaro running. So it's and, not uh, running Android; it's running no. Linux. It, it's running Linux. Linux. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, I'm trying to do this backwards. Oh yes. So. <laughs> uh, anyway, I'm I'm not sure exactly what I'm doing because I I kind of <laughs> see. It. Good ad uh, review, Bo. Bo. Good ad, but you, you sold me. I'll I'll take one. You sold I actually, me. Actually, <laughs> yeah, I, I want one even more now. That yeah, ice cream see on the back is really yeah, absolutely. Me on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Sorry, and today so I, fold, I found the one of the um, um, uh, that was that I was planning to show, to show you yesterday, but I didn't find it. And then this morning I remember that oh, I have one box tucked away in another room that I didn't <laughs> look inside. Um, Is that? I thought it was a game and watch. Oh yeah, my goodness, yeah. Liam, come see this. Can you make a noise for me? Oh, yeah, there it is. Making a noise. This one. An <laughs> actual game and watch. Yeah. Um, pre Nintendo, so that was what created the Nintendo. Yeah, it's it's from uh, 1985. I've had it. Um, I've had this one for uh, 21 Unreal. years now. And I understand, like, if if that didn't happen. If that guy wasn't such a pushy salesman, it Nintendo might not have happened. Wow. wow. That's awesome. And wow. it still works. I put wow. it in some fresh batteries for, 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 for today. You're cool, eh? That's <laughs> right. That a right there. No, that was pre... Well, it might say Nintendo on it, does it? Yeah, yeah, it does. Okay. Yeah, because uh, they were the two, um, uh, two two vendors, um, and uh, I don't know the uh, remember the name of the other one, but it it was a a, a clone of uh, a, a Nintendo, and I, I used to have one of the clones, and I had uh, the one. Um, mm -hmm. um, it it was um, uh, breaking uh, 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 breaking out, out of prison. Uh, it was a. A searchlight going uh, all around, and you had to avoid the searchlight, and you had to avoid uh, mm. two two guard runs, and then you had to walk up to to the um, uh, fence, and uh, the first one had to knock a hole in the fence and then escape. And yeah, I think I had my, my uh, all time high was uh, almost five 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 hundred points, and at uh, that uh, and uh, when closing uh, uh, passing four hundred points, the searchlight was really going fast. <laughs> <laughs> I had that for uh, three or four years, and then um, we moved, and I haven't seen it since. Um, if I recall correctly, I think Game & Watch was a device out of Japan that um, yeah, Nintendo didn't, they didn't create. Always. Nintendo already existed, but Nintendo would have folded if Game & Watch, the guy who was selling Game & Watch, came to them and said, please carry this. So they have slapped their name on it, and it became a Nintendo product. And made Nintendo what what they became, I guess. Well, you're calling it a gaming watch. Game, but that does game not look like watch. <clears throat> and watch. Okay, so how does that thing convert to a watch? <laughs> because it, it it also has a watch. So does it have a clock at least? Yes. yes. <laughs> there you go. And What's so GWG awesome. doing down there? We can't we can't see what you're working on because your mic isn't on. I see that. Oh, this, yeah, this is my gaming system. Nice, nice. This is a little one. Uh, 
this I built three of these. This is the little one. There's a medium sized one that I built because my nephews were fighting over the fact there's only one controller on this thing. Oh. And then there is the full size arcade cabinet that I built for a friend after they saw the other two. Sweet. Uh, Liam wants to show you guys his retro gaming console. Oh, is, is that, that the new one? Yeah. Is that the new one? Right up to the. That's the uh, at games. Uh, this is the Sega Genesis. Oh. Do you want to put on like Sonic? Show them how cool it is. Yeah, it's got like what about two thousand Sega part. games on it. I was hoping to get one of those new O droids, but I gather it's back ordered. Hold it up to the camera. Oh, he's got Sonic running for you guys. Copyright infringement right here. Oh boy. <laughs> you guys see that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> you got his own. Nice. It's really hard to see on camera, isn't it? Yeah. Just or something. Blue, uh, it's <laughs> actually these things are awesome. That's cool. Nice, buddy. Those things are awesome. It takes an SD card so you can pop a ROM on it and it will it will boot the ROM. <laughs> Hey, uh, guess what happened this morning, guys? You'll never guess. Uh -oh. The alarm I, took, uh, uh, worked. <laughs> I, I got to work where I am now, and maybe 10 minutes later, 15 minutes after I got here, I got a phone call from our alarm company that uh, our alarm was going off at the, at the new studio. I was so going to say the alarm went off. I, I had a feeling it was something like <laughs> yeah. that. I was going to, I was going to say it jokingly, but I'm glad I didn't. Yeah. So I, my initial thought was, oh, okay, well, there must be a false alarm. Like you know, we just had it installed on Saturday, right? So sometimes there's some kinks to to work out. Um, so I emailed the alarm company and and asked them to send me a copy of the manual so I can reprogram the terminal thing just in case it was a false alarm. And, and I, and I went there and everything was fine. So I called off the police and told them we didn't need anyone because it was a false alarm. Um, and then I went back over my surveillance footage just on a whim. And sure enough, 8.37 this morning, my door opens wide and a guy walks in, looks around, wow. looks around, and then the alarm starts going off and then he quickly gets out. And uh, How did he get in? Exactly. So... That was my thought. So I'm sitting there watching this surveillance video and I'm, and I can't see his face. I can't see any, uh, because I haven't set up the surveillance yet. So mm. it was just the, the camera in the, uh, in the office mm. happened to be pointed toward the door. So I saw the door open, a guy walk in, you see kind of his right side and he's looking around and then he gets What's out of there when, the when the alarm goes off. Right. So as I'm watching this footage, I hear somebody rustling on my door. So I jump up and I run to the, to the door of the studio and I whip it open and I say, you can't come in here. <laughs> Remember, wow. I'm just watching the surveillance and I see this guy yeah, yeah. in my place. Turns out he's one of the maintenance workers at the complex. Oh, no. <laughs> and he didn't, when, when they leased out our unit, they didn't mark us as a, uh, as a leased unit. They oh, had, because no. they're short staffed, right? Because of the COVID nineteen, they've been closed. Yeah. So we're moved in. We've got our alarm set up, but they didn't mark it as uh, as um, not vacant. So so he, he thought, thought it was empty. He thought it was empty, and cool. he's going around from all of the empty units. He's got a clipboard of all the empty units, and they do an inspection at the beginning of every month. Um, I guess presumably to prepare them for you know that month's you know tours mm. and trying to rent it out. But uh, mm. so he had walked right in. He had a key, obviously. He just walked right in, <laughs> set off the alarm, and he's just freaking out. And of course, my his first impression of me is me yanking the door open and yelling at him. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, man, I'm so oh, sorry. Geez. I had no idea who you were or what you were doing. All I know is that the police are here. My alarm went off this morning. I got to call the alarm company and get them to reset the code. And... Yeah, so that's how my day started. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And that happened this morning? Happened this morning, yeah. Oh, so I got a voicemail. I got a voicemail from the property management company all apologetic and they're and they're going on about how you know it'll never happen again. We've marked the least. <laughs> We're so sorry. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so I'm just Why hoping was that? 
I'm really hoping I don't get a bill for a false alarm. <laughs> a good point, because if the police get called out, they'll uh, they'll charge you for that. So. And you want to know what's neat is that um, I got there within 10 minutes and the police mm. were already there. Oh, so yeah. Oh, yeah. They were. Uh, they they were don't good. mess around with that stuff. Yeah. I poured myself a coffee in this particular mug as a reminder to let yeah. you know that uh, Andrew, Andrew Lloyd Webber is broadcasting the 25th anniversary stage production of the musical on YouTube oh. this weekend. Oh. So it's a limited time thing. It's for 48 hours, I think, in the UK and 72 hours in the rest of the world, I believe, wow. because of copyright. So um, I posted the link to that under... Um, I think I, I forget what the videos channel is on discord. I think it's called like interesting videos mm -hmm. or channel on discord. If you click on there, it's the last video that I posted, but it okay. is limited. It's only this weekend. If you want to see the stage production, which I think is cool because growing I up definitely will. being such a fan of the Phantom of the Opera mm -hmm. as a child, having seen it at Pantages theater when I was in grade six um, mm -hmm. and then like following the musical for years after that. Um, I always wanted to have, uh, a recording of the the actual stage production rather than the movie. The movie came out and that was something, but it wasn't as good. Mm -hmm. um, so it's nice to see a proper produced stage version of the show. So that's yeah, really, I, really cool. I went to see it in a smaller theatre, so it was oh, not yes. as majestic as it would have been in, in mm. one of the larger theatres. Um, and I did get the uh, original... Um, the CD of the original cast uh, recording. So with but not original video, Canadian or, or UK? This was a UK, I believe. Okay. Yeah. I can't remember I can't remember his name. I would yeah, as I soon as I as soon as I hear it. I know, I know here it was Colm Wilkinson it here. No, that yeah. wasn't the right one. No, Colm Colm from Ireland was was the Phantom here in Canada. Okay. So and I know who you're talking about, and I'm trying to find the CD, and I don't, I don't, just don't see it off. I want to say Kevin or Brian or no. something like that, but it's I, I can't think of it. Maybe I'll switch around my camera, and I can like give you a little bit of a walkthrough of what I'm yes, doing. Yes, please. Yeah. Yes, please. If I can, okay. So let's see. I'm, I'm really new at this. I'm getting really dizzy. Wow. So, okay. Here we. Sorry. Okay, here we go. <laughs> so, have you ever um, taken carpet adhesive off of? Uh, uh, floorboard. It's, it's horrible. Very difficult. Is, oh, yeah, that's yeah. Terrible. I've been using that iron on steam and just mm -hmm. steaming the bejeebas out of that. <laughs> if I go to the other side of the attic, obviously there's still like lots of work that needs to be done up here. This is like a this horror is gonna, movie. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> when you move this, really quickly. <laughs> this but is going to be that. my cat five office. There's plenty of room so, up there, but it, is, it yeah. is it insulated though? I mean, what's it going to be like in the middle it's, of summer? That'll be hot. Well, it's really stinking hot right now. I'm not surprised. There's no insulation in the rafters there. <clears throat> no, none at all. And in the winter, it'll be terrible. Um, yeah, yeah, you're going to have to insulate that whole area there, Sasha, for that to be yes. viable. Yeah. <laughs> that is my washing machine. Uh, this should, should be my office down here. Yes, you really need to make this part of your part of this your office. It's far more suitable. Yeah, and in, and in, in uh, really hot days, it will be a um, cool. It'll be cooler. Uh, yep. Yeah, that's I have the true. Same, uh, in my house, uh, oh, the this should be this is cooler. This would be much place, better. Uh, Thirty-two degrees <laughs> last summer. Yes. Okay. What I think we've decided on is making a cluster of independent so a cluster as in uh multiple devices but independent as in each one will have its own distro uh raspberry pi unit um that will each have uh the raspberry pi os and zoom installed and each one of those has an hdmi output so then each raspberry pi becomes a camera source essentially for zoom so i'd have one Raspberry Pi dedicated to Jeff, and that would be HDMI out into his capture. And then when I push the button on the on the uh, stream deck, it would switch to his camera, basically. 
uh, and then have one for Sasha and one for Henry and however we want to set it up. So it's just like one Raspberry Pi per person. <laughs> it might work. So that's kind but of what, where. What I'm sorry. Can. I think I missed what it is you were meaning to do with that Raspberry Pi. Being to able to have it, have them come in remotely through Zoom. Ah, I see. Okay, got because, it. Because for the show, we obviously don't want this grid layout, and we can't have mm -hmm. it so that it's switching back and forth every time someone speaks. And but you also, need a you need a separate input for each of them, so you yeah. can edit them post as much as any way you like. And even right? and even live, we need to be able to switch to the person who's speaking manually. Yes. And I and and people may not realize, but. Um, Zoom cannot be running on the broadcast system because it's broadcasting. So that means the good camera that I use is out of it, basically. It, so during the interview or during the conversation, I would be on my phone, which would. Be and you've terrible. done you've done this before, though, as I recall, because you you did the same thing. Um, Not live. Oh, good point. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> It live changes live everything. Hot, like yeah, that. I was about to say and, the and same we thing. Found that out yeah. Wednesday, we found that out when my Pinebook Pro would not yeah. work for the feature. And then, so then, signed <laughs> off, rebooted, changed the way I connected things. I plugged the uh, I plugged the uh, Atomos Ninja Flame into the Pinebook Pro and pushed the cord. Mm -hmm. Worked flawlessly. So, so, so we then, need about a half a dozen Raspberry Pi for eight gigs. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. So, so, well, I think four would do it because four is as many inputs as I have. Oh, that's so, no fun. That's no fun. Yeah. <laughs> so then we just, so basically that would allow us to treat each person on their Zoom connection as a, as a camera source. So mm -hmm. I think that could work and it's probably a pretty good way to do it on the cheap. On the cheap, it's going to cost like, you know, four Raspberry Pis here in Canada is like 600 bucks. So, you know what? It's like two dollars American, right? <laughs> it's ridiculous. Robert said to me because Robert's in Florida, right? And he's like, "Oh yeah, yeah a Raspberry Pi is only seventy-five bucks for the new one." Really? Hundred and ten dollars here just for the board. Yikes. Plus, Yikes. you got to buy the power supply. Plus, you got to buy the case. I so you're all said I'm not even sure I would like use a hundred bucks. I'm not even sure I'd use a Raspberry Pi for that anymore. I probably. Mm -hmm. You've already Use already been desktop. talking about the uh, no. You've already been talking about the Odroid. Um, uh, what True. was it? C four, I believe. Yeah, I don't know. Yep. I haven't looked yet. I don't know if they're any cheaper. I need to hit hit up a Meridroid and see mm. uh, see what they've got. But mm. maybe that's I like an the way option. You think. My yeah, problem. I, my problem is clear, that yeah. I really don't like how the Raspberry Pi and 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 Marshman, you've you've seen this too, right? Um, You've seen where the uh, Raspberry Pi, if it loses power, uh, potentially that SD card just yes. gets corrupted. You don't, you can't yeah. afford that, especially especially not live. So, you know, maybe that's maybe that's point. an option. But I, I don't know what the price point is though. So maybe maybe just a bunch of XU4s with uh, with EMMC running sure. a Debian yeah, distro yeah. with a desktop. Yeah, and I like I like the way you're thinking. Yeah. And it's got HDMI out. I was strictly thinking, you know, I it, it, I just need a SBC with some H, uh, HDMI output. But you're mm -hmm. right; it doesn't have to be Raspberry Pi. No, nope. um, you you need for it to work, especially when you're live. You can't afford to be yeah. having it break down unexpectedly. Not just yeah. not to say that they will, but. Um, if you lose power all of a sudden, then yeah, you're going to have a yeah. But if you, you know lose what power and the SD card corrupting is the least of your problems. <laughs> well, that's yeah. true. That's a good point. Yeah, if my you're right. U, if true. my UPS is so weak it can't power four Raspberry Pis, I'm in trouble because <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, that yeah. R510 is going down. Well, you got a, a beeping at UPS, don't you? <laughs> I do. Yeah, <laughs> I got to get new batteries in that thing. Well, or yeah, it's, it's a good powering. point. Uh, yeah, I, I threw it out there for in case it would be, uh, you know, just yeah. as a, as a as an option. So yeah, I like that idea. Uh, XU fours or uh, the new C fours, any of those would probably do just fine. It's really just plugging them in and and then seeing how they how they operate with Zoom mm -hmm. and full screen. It's been so much fun getting to know certain members of our community, and I'd encourage you to become a part of our community coffee break as well. Just a great um, usually weekly 
place that you can come together on a Zoom meeting and be a part of our community in that way. So I'd encourage you to check it out, category5.tv, just scroll up, scroll down on the homepage and you'll find the schedule there, the past videos, everything else. And if you have any questions, join our Discord and that is found by clicking on Interact and then you'll see join our Discord server there at category5.tv. We've got to take a quick break. I'm going to mosey on over to the bridge and from there, we're going to get into my laptop and finally, finally fix the cooling system in that bad boy. Stick around. Welcome back. All right. So what I hope to achieve today is to demonstrate that there are some minor repairs that you can conduct yourself. This is my laptop. It's a Lenovo ThinkPad. It's a great, powerful little laptop. Big laptop, I should say. But the cooling system went all kinds of bad. So the last time I used this laptop was during an interview. And when I conducted that interview, we had all sorts of problems. I couldn't hear the question. <clears throat> oh, sorry. I'm so sorry, dude. This is really frustrating. I'm sorry, dude. Oh, patrons. And I've got, and I've got you on 100. You're it just stopped. It just stopped. Are you good? You can hear me now. Yes. Okay. So that noise was something else. And when you're doing live TV, you really just don't need that kind of stress. You know what I'm saying? So I got this open and I had a look. And even though this fan is spinning fine and everything looks okay, this cooling system is on its last legs. Maybe it's about to fail, maybe just the bearings have gone, whatever it might be, it needs replacing. But it's a big apparatus, it's not just a little fan. It's got this whole pipe cooling system going over to the CPU. So I had to get online and place an order for an identical replacement. So the laptop, while I might have thought, okay, it's dead, the cooling system is gone, it's going to be a lot of work or money, possibly. I mean, if you took it to a shop, it might cost you, you know, take the price of parts, mark it up a bunch, and then add uh, another, I don't know, a couple hundred bucks for labor. But what if I told you you could do this yourself? Pretty straightforward. So that's what I'm going to set out to do, and we're going to see if this is going to make any amount of difference and kind of how tedious this is. Now I've already had this old one kind of removed, so I've tightened things up again just so that the thermal compound wouldn't have a problem. There are a couple of screws all over the place here. You're going to need a really, really tiny screwdriver. So every laptop computer is a little bit different. Of course, you can, you can guess that. However, um, the concepts that I try to instill are that from piece to piece, from component to component, from computer to computer, you can do this. It's not that difficult. You just got to find the problem and be very gentle. I always say, like, just take your time. If something doesn't seem to want to give, it's probably you've missed a screw or something. You don't have to pull. So right now, for example, I'm noting that there is a there you go, uh, a wire that is not wanting to give, and it's because it's actually part of the computer, not part of the fan assembly. So you got to be mindful of that kind of thing. Never yank, never pull, and be patient. Gentle and patient. Now, before I get too far into my maker tech, let's get our maker on. 
So this is the central processing unit, the CPU of our laptop computer. So just like your desktop computer, you've got a CPU. You've got that brains chip of your computer. Now, ideally, you're going to have something like a lint-free cloth or perhaps some cotton or something like that to clean with. In pandemic times, we're steampunking it out and I'm using paper towel because it's all I got and it's all I can get because the stores are hard to get access to. So I just need to be careful that I don't get lint on that. So I do have 99% alcohol. This is a solvent that is going to help me to clean off all of this gooky thermal paste. So you can see how there's a bunch of sticky gunk on there, which is the thermal compound that is a conductive, uh, a, a heat conductive um, compound to help to, dis, uh, to make that good thermal contact between the heat sink and the CPU. So with some good strong 99% isopropyl or rubbing alcohol. I'm just going to very gently dab that off. So we're just cleaning off all of the old thermal compound because we're going to be applying some new. So this again is a, see that? This is a task that you'll be able to do yourself and you can be confident as long as you're careful because I don't want you to break stuff. Okay. Um, you can be confident in doing this. Now, it's always a good idea to start with, if this is your first computer repair, start with something cheaper than a Lenovo ThinkPad. You don't want to do this on your main production computer. Start with things like a Raspberry Pi. This is one of the things that makes single board computers. Like here's a, an Odroid XU4Q. Well, get yourself one. Go get one. Take that big old heat sink off the top there and play around with it and don't be afraid to break it because they're super cheap. Get yourself a Raspberry Pi, which is even cheaper because it's not as powerful. And don't go with a Raspberry Pi 4 because that's not going to be cheap. Go with something like a 3B and just use it as a, a test bed to be able to um, play around and not, don't be afraid to wreck it. It's okay to wreck things, but don't wreck your good laptop. You want to be mindful of that. But, you know, single board computing has really given us a platform that we can screw around and we don't have to be afraid of busting things up. All right, I'm going to give that just a quick little dab dry. And I'm being careful not to leave like chunks of paper towel behind because paper towel is not the ideal thing. It works. Some people are saying, oh, don't use paper towel. Well, it works. It's makeshift. It's pandemic, but it works. And there is my CPU now. So it's nice and clean and it is ready to receive the new cooling system and some good new thermal compound. All right. So here's our cooling system that I picked up online. And incidentally, buying the parts myself was significantly cheaper than getting the parts through a local computer shop. And I'm not afraid to goof around. There we are. Again, don't force things. Take your time. There it is. So here's the original. Here's the new one. Can you tell the difference? Hmm. All right. So we want to Take a peek at this. It looks like they have some thermal compound added to the block, but it has a piece of plastic over top, I believe. I'm just going to confirm that. Maybe not. Maybe it's like a, a solid kind of thermal sticker. Yeah, it is. So what I want to do is I actually want to grab a tube of thermal compound that I've chosen and you can pick up some of this like online or at your local computer shop if they're open. And you just want to get some dabs on there right on the processor. This is going to give us a good thermal contact between the two. Whoa, did that ever come out fast? That was not intentional. It doesn't really matter. You want to just have a little tiny doppel there because as soon as I stick that down, that's just going to go, which is fine, but 
it's a little bit messy. All right, so now I want to remount this, the new one. So I'm mounting the new one exactly as the old one came out. And that is going to go, let's see here, right over top of the CPU. Let's grab our screwdriver and start screwing that down so that that can get a nice thermal linkage between the processor and the, the um, copper cooler. So I'm just tightening them about a third of the way just to get it affixed. And then I'm going to tighten it right up. There we are. So there's nothing overly complicated about this type of repair. Things like upgrading your RAM. You can see that I've got an extra RAM module slot here. So if I wanted to, I could buy an identical RAM uh, DIMM here and put it here. And then I'd basically get twice as much RAM if you wanted to do an upgrade. This is my hard drive. If I wanted to upgrade the hard drive, put an SSD in there, I could replace that with an SSD and then reinstall my Linux Mint. Uh, what else could I do? Here's a battery for the CMOS, the, the memory. Um, so I could replace that if I ever start losing um, memory, which happens after the battery gets old. This is the Wi-Fi chip here. Um, what else do we need to see? Like, it's like there are so many components here that are so easily accessible that I could repair myself, which is brilliant. All right, so now I need to just give this a little bit of a, a shimmy there because it's never been in a computer, so it's just a little bit off on its fitting. But it looks great. Perfect fit, really. If I can get this final screw to go in. Oh! Remember, just take your time. It's not like you're doing a TV show and you need to make it look like you know what you're doing. <laughs> there it is. So that is strapped in. Okay, so now we've got our fan in place. We've got this guy here, which we need to... So this is the cable that... Uh, was affixed to the other one. It looks like they've already included like a double-sided sticker here, an adhesive to reapply that to the new fan. That's kind of cool. So they've thought of it all. And then that's going to go right here. Whatever this is, it might be video or audio or some crazy thing connecting into the board. I'm not too sure. As long as you put it back the way it should go, you're golden. Just like anything, as you disassemble something, make sure you observe how it goes back together. And now here's the fan power and PWM for the power management. And I'm just going to carefully plug that in where the old fan unplugged. Hmm. And that, that is a problem because the fan that I ordered has two more pins or it's just a different adapter. Let's count the cables. So let's see. We've got one, one, two, three, four, five. And on the old fan, we've got one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So I'm going to have to do a little bit of a modification here in order to get this fan to be able to connect to this power supply, which is fine, except I have a problem. I'm operating in pandemic mode <laughs> and I, in this studio space, have not yet unpacked my soldering tools. So this feature, which is meant to be just finished today, is going to end up being a two part because I'm going to have to solder these wires together. So what I have done is I've removed the incorrect header. And I've separated out the wires. They are all color-coded, so I'm good to go. And I've got the correct header 
right here from the old fan. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be connecting these wires together correctly, but I need to heat shrink tube them. Heat tube shrink them? I don't know. I need to connect those together th with solder and I need to uh, shrink tube them as well to protect the cable. So unfortunately, I don't have the tools at my disposal in order to do that right now. That said, I will have and we'll be able to complete this on a very soon future episode. But everything else fit perfectly. It's just that header, which is unfortunate. I had hoped that we'd be able just to pull this off very easily tonight. But it does turn into a bit more of a maker tech solution, doesn't it? Since, the, since we do have to do some soldering, which is unexpected and not necessarily normal either. Um, they must have changed the header at some point or made some kind of change to that header to make it so that it's not the right size. Uh, but we'll fix that. And that's one of the things, too, is that you can take cables and you can splice them and, and make them work together. And that's uh, one of the exciting things about doing Maker Tech is that you can make things work that generally otherwise would not work. And then you can make them, you know, you save yourself a boatload of money when you can do it yourself. But at this point, we've got to call it quits on this, so watch our channel, Category5.tv, for part two of the fan replacement series. <laughs> and on part two, I'm going to be soldering these cables together, we're going to be shrink tubing them, and we're going to fire it up and uh, see how things work, and see how that cooler has improved. In the meantime, we've got to head over to the newsroom, so here is Becca. Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.TV newsroom. Samsung Blu-ray and DVD players around the world are bricking themselves automatically. FIFA 21 will be the most realistic yet. Space exploration company SpaceX applied for a license to offer satellite-based service to rural areas in Canada. Google has quietly launched an AI-powered Pinterest rival named Keen. Apple is moving to ARM processors, and Microsoft's Mixer streaming platform is dead. Stick around, the full details and this week's Crypto Corner are coming up. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. From the newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. Samsung users, unplug your ethernet. Millions of Samsung Blu-ray and DVD players are being bricked all around the world. Entertainment has become one of the biggest tools for keeping sane during these trying times, but while many companies are aggressively pushing their streaming services, others still prefer owning the media they buy in physical form. That mostly means DVDs and Blu-ray discs, which of course require appropriate devices to play them. But what if those devices all suddenly stop working for no apparent reason? That's the rather eerie and frustrating situation that owners of Samsung Blu-ray players are now experiencing, experiencing around the world with no answer or solution yet in sight. There doesn't seem to be any common denominator other than the fact that it's happening across a number of Samsung's Wi-Fi or Ethernet connected Blu-ray and DVD players. It doesn't appear to matter which model. The most common behavior reported is that the players reboot themselves after a few seconds, causing an inescapable boot loop. Others have reported hearing noises as if the players were reading empty disk slots. Given the mysterious and sudden appearance of the bug, some people have different theories on what caused it. Some blame an overnight firmware update, but the range of devices covered is so wide and random that it seems less likely. Some believe it may be an expired SSL security certificate in the firmware, which could explain why no amount of resetting the device to factory settings seems to work. Unfortunately, Samsung remains unresponsive despite the growing number of complaints, possibly due to how it happened during the weekend. Given global conditions, it's understandable how owners are not so amused, especially if it will require them to turn in the device for manual servicing. 
FIFA game developer EA Sports promises that the next generation version of FIFA 21 will feature new technology to make it the most realistic yet. The FIFA series remains one of the most popular video game franchises in the world. Next year's entry will release for both existing consoles as well as the new Xbox Series X and PlayStation 5. But EA says the newer consoles will take advantage of more advanced technology. Despite regular criticism that the annual game is often very similar to the previous year's entry, it had sold over 260 million copies as of 2018. EA says its newest title will feature more lifelike player movements, which it says will be the most authentic character behaviors uh, ever seen in sports video games. The next generation editions will feature significantly reduced loading times, and the PS5 version will take advantage of haptic feedback on the consoles. DualSense controller. New rendering and lighting techniques will also help to increase the overall realism of the game. Fans in the stadium stands will also be more interactive, even participating in celebrations. FIFA 21 will be released worldwide in October before the new consoles launch. The PS5 and Xbox Series X versions with their advanced features will be available later, but EA is offering a path to players who buy the game on the previous generation early. Sadly, Nintendo Switch gamers won't get to experience any of the franchise's new models or gameplay innovations. The lower-powered portable console will instead get a Legacy Edition release that will include only new kits and teams and an updated menu and overlay system. EA has promised to reveal more about the game in the coming months. Elon Musk's SpaceX has applied to offer high-speed internet to Canadians living in remote areas using satellite technology. Last year, SpaceX has launched more than 500 satellites into Earth orbit to build its Starlink mega constellation, which aims to make satellite internet available from practically anywhere on the planet. SpaceX applied with Canada's telecom regulator, the Canadian Radio, Television and Telecommunications Commission, CRTC, for what's known as a Basic International Telecommunications Services, or BITS, license. That's a requirement for any company that wants to offer what the CRTC calls telecommunications traffic between Canada and any other country. If they are successful in getting a BITS license, that means SpaceX, whose formal company name is Space Exploration Technologies Corp., could theoretically try to offer more wireless telecom services down the line, such as voice and data plans. But for now, the application focuses on high-speed internet beamed directly into rural homes and businesses via the company's existing network of so-called near-Earth satellites. Canada is far from the only place SpaceX is trying to offer internet service. The company is planning to offer high-speed internet services in the United States later this year through a subsidiary known as Starlink before rapidly expanding to near global coverage of the populated world by 2021, as they say on the company website. CRTC data suggests as many as 40% of Canadians who don't live in major urban areas do not have access to high-speed internet, and what is available is often prohibitively expensive. The issue has taken on increased importance during the COVID-19 pandemic, as millions of Canadians find themselves working from home with seemingly no end in sight. The application was filed in May, and the, de and the deadline for public comment was last Friday. More than 1,200 Canadians have weighed in on the proposal, a large number of them in support of it. Elon Musk says the new service won't require a special installer. There's just two instructions and they can be done in either order. Point at sky, plug in. Starlink hopes to make its services available worldwide and you can receive a notification once it's available in your area by signing up at starlink.com. Google has launched an artificial intelligence powered Pinterest killer? Mm, at least competitor called Keen. Also, Apple is switching to ARM processors and Microsoft is shutting down its Mixer streaming video service. Becca's got those stories coming right up. And also Robert Koenig, our crypto correspondent is here with the Crypto Corner. Don't go anywhere. Welcome to 
of the Crypto Corner. This week we've got some interesting news for you. But as usual, let's start looking into the market. How did the market perform in the last seven days? As we can see, no big changes here. Last week it was a draw on 274 billion. Today, or currently, it's 278 billion. Uh, Bitcoin had an increase of 2.4% in the last seven days. But if we sort this here by seven days, we see suddenly compound increasing by 292%. There are over 20 coins that had an increase of over 15%. And on the downside, only two coins lost more than 15%. So what happened here? Why is there suddenly such a big change? And if we look into the DeFi market cap, because Compound is part of the DeFi market, we see that most of those changes are coming from uh, Compound. So last week I showed you this uh, this chart and it was a 2.3 billion, now it's 6.7 billion. As you can see, most of that is coming from Compound. Now <clears throat> let's dive a little bit deeper into this here and check what happened. And if we take a look at the Compound plat uh, platform, so compound.finance, we see it's basically like a bank. So you can supply money <clears throat> to the environment or you can borrow money. And in the case of, let's say, BAT, uh, basic attention token, you will receive 27%. And if you borrow money, you have to pay 34%. So far, everything is fine. Now, last week, uh, Compound was listed on Coinbase and that caused a huge increase in price. And because of that, this environment went absolutely crazy. And the reason is that every time you take out a loan or receive money, you'll be compensated with COMS, which is the native token of uh, this platform. So you'll receive money, in other words, if you take out a loan. And to check that, there's another website called predictions.exchange. And if I say I want to have 1,000 here, so enter 1,000, uh, basic attention token and I do calculate, then I see that I will receive on top of those thousand dollars, I will receive 17% uh, interest. So I don't have to pay interest, I will receive 17% interest. Now, <clears throat> some people are clever and they take that money and put it back into the system. And that's called uh, yield farming. And with yield farming, you can achieve... Um, uh, interests of uh, over 100%. Now, I have to clearly say at this stage, so it's a huge disclaimer, what you're hearing here is not financial advice. This is a very young industry. Um, it's guided by software and there are plenty of bugs in software and also it can be hacked. So it's a very risky uh, environment and if you don't understand the details of what is happening here, please do not invest any money. Even small amounts can be dangerous because the fees uh, can be as high as $15 for one transaction. So just to give you an example of why uh, one has to be careful, here's somebody that put uh, money into the system and took out, so he was doing yield farming and then suddenly realized that he had much less money available. And the reason is that he was liquidated because of uh, the interest uh, that he didn't consider. And this is a hard environment. It's guided by software. And um, if you don't have enough collateral in the system, you will be liquidated. There's nobody that will call you and say, hey, you need to put money in this year so you're not, you're not, liqu you're not being liquidated. And that's why you have to be really, uh, please be careful. I'm showing this to you because DeFi as such is a market that is uh, coming. As you can see, it's completely different to what you are accustomed to as a bank customer, but it's the future. Yeah, It's decentralized, which means there is no entity behind this here. It's completely autonomous uh, from any federal uh, institution or financial institution, and it's global. So everybody in the world can participate here. In other words, you can be your own bank by putting money into it and taking money out. But as mentioned, you need to understand what this is about. And so as long as you don't understand things like what is Aave, what do they do, what's uh, WBTC, wrapped BTC, REN BTC, uh, DYDX, uh, wrapped ETH, all those things, if you don't understand what ha is happening here, um, please don't put money, any money into that. Um, there is no, there is no customer service that you can call in case uh, something goes wrong. But as mentioned, this is the future. 
this is where finance will go to because uh, it cuts out the middleman, it cuts out the bank um, and uh, you can do business directly and it's secured because it's secured through the Ethereum blockchain. So um, more, to, more is to come in this in, uh, industry, more is going to be invented. And yeah, anyway, that, that's it uh, from uh, me um, this week. I hope you enjoyed this uh, short uh, excursion into the DeFi market, the news of, on what's happening there. And uh, thank you very much for watching and I hope to see you next week again. So thank you. Bye bye. Well, thanks, Robert. Always appreciate your insight. Uh, just a reminder for those of you watching at home, we are not providing basically financial investment advice. What we're doing is we're giving you the information about the cryptocurrency market and leaving it up to you to make the decisions. And now back to Becca. Thank you, Robbie. Google's Area 120 team, an internal incubator that creates experimental apps and services, has launched Keen, a would-be Pinterest rival that draws on the search giant's machine learning expertise to curate topics. Available on the web at staykeen.com and on Android, co-founder CJ Adams says Keen aims to be an alternative to mindlessly browsing online feeds. Adam writes in a blog post, on Keen, you say what you want to spend more time on and then create content from the web and people you trust to help make that happen. You make a Keen, which can be about any topic, whether it's baking delicious bread at home, getting into birding, or researching typography. Keen lets you curate the content you love, share your collection with others, and find new content based on what you have saved. Pinterest has already captured the hobby-focused side of this market with its pinboard-style visual design, two characteristics that Keen is trying to imitate, but Keen has Google's ex expertise in machine learning which Adam says will surface helpful content related to your interests. Google has never been able to break into the social space, a venue of online activity that generates scads of lucrative data for targeting ads. A Pinterest-style social network would really allow it to hone in on users' interests and gather this information. And it does seem that data collected by Keen is being collated with everything else Google knows about users. You log into Keen using your Google account and clicking on the site's privacy link just points you to the Google-wide privacy policy. It's interesting to see Google push its machine learning systems into more varied applications, especially those that seem like they're trying to foster users' interest in rewarding hobbies rather than algorithms that drive people to greater engagement without caring what it is they're actually engaging with. Will you give Keen a try? Are your interests such that you don't mind Google knowing what you're into? Comment below if you're watching online or hop onto our website to post your thoughts. On episode 648, just seven weeks ago, we talked about how Apple plans to drop Intel for its own processors for future Macs. But it came as a surprise Monday that these processors will be ARM-based. It's a big move, and perhaps the biggest addition the transition to ARM-powered chips brings is the ability for iOS and iPad apps to run natively on macOS in the future. Apple says most apps will just work, meaning you'll be able to run native macOS apps alongside native iOS apps side by side. Apple is promising new levels of performance and far less power consumption when it, with its move to in-house processors. Apple is designing its own range of SoC for Macs with unique features to Mac, but a common architecture across product lines. Microsoft is working on Office updates for the new Mac Silicon, and Word and Excel are already running natively on the new Mac processors, with PowerPoint even using Apple's Metal Tech for rendering. Apple has always been also been working with Adobe to get their photo editing apps up and running on the new chips. Mac OS Big Sur will also include a new version of Rosetta. Apple used Rosetta previously for the PowerPC shift to Intel-based Macs, and Rosetta 2 will automatically translate exi existing apps at install time. This means that even if developers haven't fully updated their apps, they should still work without modification. Apple is also using virtualization for running versions of Linux on these new Macs. Apple's transition to ARM follows a similar move by Microsoft to experiment with Windows on ARM nearly a decade ago. Microsoft started this work ahead of the Windows 8 release in 2012 and even released the Windows RT operating system that was designed for ARM-based hardware. 
Microsoft has since transitioned Windows 10 to ARM as well. Apple will release the first Mac with Apple Silicon at the end of this year, and it expects the transition to take two years. New Intel-powered Macs are still in the pipeline, so Apple isn't moving exclusively to ARM-based Macs just yet. Microsoft is shutting down Mixer, its video game live streaming platform, in a move that will affect streamers from Tyler Ninja Belvins on down. In a statement released on Mixer's official blog on Monday, the streaming service announced that it will be shuttering its operations side and will help Mixer streamers transition to Facebook gaming. Starting on July 22nd, Mixer.com will redirect to FB.gg. In a similar statement on its blog, Facebook Gaming noted that Mixer streamers that choose to move to Facebook Gaming will be matching partner agreements as closely as possible. Most famously, Ninja had signed an exclusivity deal with Mixer in August 2019 for reportedly around $20 to $30 million per year. In an interview with The Verge, Microsoft's head of gaming, Phil Spencer, said that the move to shut down Mixer was a strategic one. Spencer said, it wasn't as much about return on sell, it was about finding a partnership, partnership that was the best things for the community and streamers. We think this is it, and it gives us a great place to launch more xCloud content and give gamers the ability to play from there. While media is focused almost entirely on the result of streamers, the fact remains Mixer is closing down without so much as notifying its staff. Trust and safety staffer Jazuki said on Twitter Monday, Guys, we had no clue. I found out with the rest of you. I am devastated. I have dedicated all I have to this platform, and this hurts immensely. According to Microsoft, Mixer's intellectual property and staff will be transferred to the Microsoft Teams division on July 22nd, but Jazuki make it sounds like that's not the case at all. She's tweeting a call for employers to reach out to her if they're looking to hire a strong-willed, empowered female who focuses on efficiency and high productivity with a team mentality. And she retweeted I am Brandon, who said there are a lot of people out of jobs now due to Mixer closing. During a pandemic, what the H-E-L-L. Launched in January 2016 as Beam, Mixer was renamed after its acquisition by Microsoft in 2017. The platform's attempt to compete with Twitch resulted in the signings of major Twitch streamers such as Ninja and Shroud for huge monetary deals. Despite these moves, Mixer was unable to significantly approach Twitch's larger audience numbers. Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron, patron at patreon.com slash category5. From the Category5.tv newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. We're on Twitter at Category5TV. I'm personally on Twitter at Robbie Ferguson, and I follow back. Don't forget, you can find us on all of your favorite platforms. If you've got Roku, hey, do a quick search in the channel store for Category5TV. You'll find us there. Also, we're on YouTube, as you can expect. What show isn't? We're on Bookface. I mean Facebook as well. So just do a quick search for Category5 Technology TV. I'm sure you'll find us on your favorite platform. And of course, everything comes together on our website, category5.tv. I appreciate you being here again with us this week, and I'm looking forward to seeing you again next week as we get back into our MicroTick series. I'll see you then. Bye-bye.